Good evening, everybody. We are so glad to have you with us tonight. Uh, my name is Stephen Kurtz. I am a board member uh, with the Selective Mutism Association, and it's my great pleasure to be here tonight with uh, John Kohlmeyer, who will introduce himself in a minute. I just want to make sure you're aware that uh, this webinar is brought to you uh, thanks to a generous grant from the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation. They've been huge supporters of our efforts, and we're very, very grateful. Uh, by way of housekeeping, the webinar is being recorded, and we'll have it posted up on the website within 24 to 48 hours, and a link will be sent to all the registrants uh, early next week. So uh, the way we have this set up, John will be talking for a while, and then we're going to be ready for your questions. The format is to go to the questions section of your control panel, enter your questions there. I'll be moderating the questions, kind of looking for themes and particular questions, I'll present them to John on your behalf. And we have a full hour together, so I hope we get to cover a lot of interesting things. So just by way of a quick introduction, I'm Stephen Kurtz, I'm a child psychologist, and I've had the great fortune to be involved with selective mutism for about 19 or 20 years, as John will elaborate on in a little bit. And it's an honor for me to be a volunteer uh, board member with the Selected Mutism Association. Our website is chock full of resources, school-based resources, assessment resources, treatment resources. And there are always exciting things going on, including an upcoming two-day parent training. And then periodically, we're also hosting professionals trainings. So with uh, no further ado, John, I'll let you introduce yourself and carry on. Sounds great. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Kohlmeyer. Um, I used to have selective mutism, no shock, um, as you're all here today. Um, so there's two things I'd like to say before I start. Um, I'm not a doctor, not a treating professional. Everything I'm going to talk about today is about my own experiences. I can only tell you what worked for me. Um, I'll probably say a few things about SM in general, but that's really just based on, I'm just basing that off of what I went through when I was younger. Um, and also, second, just because I got over my SM by doing certain things um, doesn't mean that's the only way to get over SM, but I'm hoping that from my story, you'll be able to pick up some tricks that we implemented along the way and see you can, how you can adapt them for yourself. So just format-wise, I'm going to tell you a bit about my story for 10 to 15 minutes, and the rest of the time we'll do Q&A. Um, I'm really trying to like to focus on that because um, parents, doctors, everybody asks lots of great questions. and that's usually where all the good uh, info comes out when I do these types of talks. Um, I'm going to do my best to condense my 15 years into 15 minutes, but we'll uh, do that. And feel free to submit your questions to Dr. Kurtz as they come to you. Um, if something fits with what I'm talking about, I'll interrupt. Um, otherwise, we'll just get to as many of them as we can at the end. So to start. Um, so when I was really little, my parents always knew that I was a somewhat shy kid. Um, even as a baby, I would get pretty antsy if someone else held me, uh, who was a stranger, or, or, or things like that. Um, but the first time they really started to notice a problem was when I was in preschool. Um, it was a pretty small class, um, so I managed, I managed pretty well. Um, I would talk to one of the teachers if no one else could hear. Um, I went to school without an issue. I participated in the work, but I just wouldn't talk to the rest of the kids or pretty much eat in school. Um, the head teacher at the at the place recommended we go see a psychologist for the first time. Kind of makes sense. Um, as a side note, this woman also told my mom that the reason why I wasn't eating in school is because she had food for me when I got home. So she told my mom that she shouldn't feed me um, when I got home when I got home uh, from school. But we did end up going to see the psychologist she recommended. Um, ironically, the guy was actually deaf, um, which didn't work out so well considering I didn't speak. But he also agreed with this teacher that the reason why I wasn't speaking in school um, was because I was doing it on purpose and I was being oppositional. Um, and he told my parents they needed to be very strict. They need to take things away from me if I didn't uh, follow the rules, um, diagnose me with oppositional, oppositional defiant disorder. Um, and suffice to say, after a few sessions, we never went back um, because it didn't really, we didn't really find much use out of it. Um, and we didn't really go look for another doctor because we, nobody really knew what was happening and it wasn't that much of an interference in school. Um, and lots of people honestly just thought I would grow out of it. I was four and didn't like to talk. It's not 
I don't think that's incredibly uncommon. Um, but only really later when I started kindergarten was when things really became noticeable. Um, on my first day of, of kindergarten, as soon as I got into the building, I pretty much froze in panic. Um, I got to my classroom and I just stood next to the door underneath the light switch and I wouldn't move past that spot. I wouldn't eat, drink, speak, participate, use the bathroom, or even sit down in front of any of the other kids or the teachers. Even if I was alone in the room, I, I, I was so overwhelmed by anxiety that I just stood there. Um, and the same thing happened the next day and pretty much for seven months after that. Um, the school, of course, told my parents that we should go see another doctor. Um, but they really didn't know what to school, what the school didn't really know what to do. Um, but the school, they also thought I was being oppositional and doing these things on purpose. Um, the way I kind of like to describe this feeling um, is to tell you to close your eyes and imagine your biggest fear is right in front of you and slowly getting closer and closer, whether that's a spider or snake or heights, um, that same adverse reaction that you feel when you see a spider is the same reaction that I felt when I was around other people when I was little. Heart started to race, got, hands got sweaty, can't focus, etc. cetera. Um, kind of to put it another way, a few years ago, I went skydiving and that anticipatory anxiety when I was sitting there in the plane with the door open at 15,000 feet with the wind blowing, that fear that I had was the exact same feeling I had when someone tried to get me to speak with them when I was in kindergarten. Um, and if you kind of think about it in that way, it kind of makes sense that a lot of these behaviors um, make sense that when you see a kid with SM, they look totally avoidant, totally, totally kind of scared out of their minds because they feel like they're about to jump out of a plane from 15,000 feet. Um, um, and going, going back to kindergarten, we ended up seeing a few more doctors, but each diagnosed me with something different. Um, autism, generalized anxiety, some other things kind of mixed in there. And because they didn't really know what was happening either, their therapy wasn't, wasn't helpful. Um, and after a while, with no real progress, the school told my parents that there was really nothing more that they can do and that I would probably never get any better. Um, and that I would have anxiety for the rest of my life and they didn't see me getting over that. Um, but I think the real reason a lot of these people never understood it was because the kid that the school saw, the kid that these even these doctors saw was not the real me. It was just the kid that they saw in public. None of them saw the kid who I was at home. I was talkative, I was friendly, even like family friends or some relatives, if it wasn't crowded, I would be talkative. Um, and I think this is something very unique to SM where um, somebody acts completely differently in one situation versus another. Um, of course, my parents didn't agree with the school. They thought there has to be more that can be done. Um, and we pursued to see another doctor. And we went, uh, fortunately, that NYU Child Study Center was about an hour from my house. Um, we went there and got an evaluation. Um, and that's where the first kind of place that we heard of what selective mutism was. Um, and that's where I met Dr. Kurtz, actually. He ended up taking on my case um, and we started working together. This was, uh, I was trying to figure out earlier, it was March 2002, uh, it's hard to believe. And pretty much almost immediately, we kind of started to see some results. And in essence, what we did was break down the process of talking in school into really, really small baby steps. First, we started in the doctor's office with toys, just my mom, not even the doctors in the room. Um, and once I was talking to the alone with her, um, somebody would, he would progressively get closer from outside the doorway, outside, not even visible to in the doorway, to sitting in the room with us. Um, and along, all along, leaving time for me to get adjust and get comfortable and at least be able to talk to my mom in his presence. Um, and then once I slowly got more comfortable, transitioning into being talkative to him, and we phased out my mom. Um, and all it sounds pretty simple when I say it like this, but this is over probably a few sessions, a few hours that this happened and happens very slow baby steps. Um, and we brought that kind of same process, the school building before school even just started. It was just us, just me and my mom in the room or just me and the doctor early in the morning before, before school even started. Um, and then brought in the teacher and just me and her, and then just one other kid, then two other kids. Um, 
And when you think about this, it sounds like kind of intuitive. Why didn't anybody just do this? But no one had tried doing this with me, breaking it down into these baby steps. Um, something I, re I remember very vividly was just even walking past the light switch in my classroom was extremely difficult. Um, the way that I actually even got over that was Dr. Kurtz lifted me up and brought me onto the carpet um, until I stopped kind of freaking out. I, I still remember that to this day. Um, and throughout this whole process of slowly challenging my anxiety, slowly doing these exposures, sort of exposure therapy, um, I would get rewards for something I did that was anxiety provoking. Um, and this was really helpful. Um, I would get, we call them brave bucks. Um, it, it worked because I was five, but they were little red pieces of paper with a picture of Batman on them. Um, and after I got a certain amount, we would go to the pet store and we'd get a toy for my hamster. And this reward system even stayed um, well into as I got older. Of course, we did it in different ways. I didn't get little pieces of paper with Batman on it, um, but we did different things. And the rewards let me to more easily kind of confront the anxiety because for a five-year-old, just talking to people may not seem uh, exciting, especially if they have a fear of it, like they're jumping out of a, a plane from 15,000 feet. Um, but having this rewards that I got at the end made like me made me able to push through that anxiety somewhat more easily. Um, Dr. Kurtz also trained the people in the school so they knew how to work with me as well. Um, and using this kind of baby step process with the reward system, we got past a lot of things that were challenging towards the end of kindergarten. I was able to sit at my desk, I was able to eat. Um, um, and kind of during that summer, Dr. Kurtz had my parents enroll me in a summer camp because they knew that Without that continued exposure practice, before the next school year, I would kind of regress. regress. And I even still find that true today, in that if I don't do something for a while, it becomes much more difficult when I actually do end up doing it. Um, before I transitioned to first grade, I made sure I met my teacher before the year started, got to pick my seat in class. And I would say almost by the end of first grade, I was almost just like any other kid, but just a very quiet one. Um, and some things were very difficult, like Jim never, Throughout school, I never even participated in gym, even when I was in high school. Um, music class was also very difficult, things like that. Um, and when I got to second grade, things became much more challenging because I think because more of expected was in me. I had a lot of trouble even handing in my work to the teacher because I didn't want anybody to see it. Um, I would get very tense in school. There was a few times I even tried to run out of the building. Um, and that's when I was at actually diagnosed with social anxiety disorder as well, which I know uh, quite a few kids who are diagnosed with SM eventually do get diagnosed with social anxiety disorder. Um, and also for those of you in the United States, I was also given an IEP, which basically just had the school that required them to give me certain accommodations. So I would get extra time on tests, separate location for tests, opportunity to pick my seat in the room. Um, the school psychologist would come or I would go to them a few times a week, the resource room where I would go to this other class where there was just a few kids where you could get extra help and work. Um, and it helped a lot kind of to break up the day and allowed me to get a break from the rest of the kids in the big classroom. And another big thing that happened in second grade is that I was also put on anti-anxiety medication and we found that it helped a lot. Um, of course, there was a lot of discussion, I think with everybody, nobody's like, oh yeah, I'll just, give my kid this medicine. Of course, there's a lot of debate, a lot of questioning, is this the right thing to do? Um, but eventually my pediatrician prescribed it at the recommendation of Dr. Kurtz, but it wasn't a cure-all by any means, um, but it just made lots of things easier to do. The way I kind of like to describe the medicine is imagine that having someone with S, asking somebody, having somebody with SM speak, it's like asking them to climb over a 10 foot wall with the right, behavior therapy and the right scaffold thing like we were we were trying to put it in place, um, you might be able to get pushed them over the hump. But for me, the medicine helped cut that wall down to five feet. It was still difficult to do those things like raise my hand in class or even just sit in the classroom at times, but the medicine made those challenges more much more manageable. So skipping pretty far ahead, um, every year had its own challenges, but things kind of progressively got better, um, keeping up with those exposures. I didn't see Dr. Kurtz continue the medicine throughout that entire time, but we went back to him around the medicine when I was having some struggles. We called them um, booster shots. 
Um, and that was mostly like during transition periods. The next big kind of anxiety challenge that I had in school was when I uh, was in eighth grade. Um, my elementary school was only like 350 kids in five grades, but my middle school was 1,700 kids in three grades. Um, at first, they kept the grades pretty isolated, so it wasn't much of a problem. But as I got older, it started to become very overwhelming. A lot of school refusal, where it was just like a big process to get out of the house in the morning. Um, and eventually, Dr. Kurt suggested to my parents that they transfer me to a private school near my house. And this was also another big turning point. Um, my entire, the entire school, pre-K through 12th grade, was only 120 kids. My eighth grade was only eight kids at the time. At first, it was difficult to be the new kid, of course, but eventually I, I really liked this environment. Um, it made a lot of things easier to do. Um, just some examples about being in a smart school. When I went to lunch, there was only 50 kids to weed through to decide where to sit rather than 600 who were eating during one lunch period. Or when I had to raise my hand in class, it was only five to 10 people. It was just much more doable than doing it in front of 35. And we, I was able to put that practice in place. Um, at least knew everybody in school or knew everybody's name. Um, it just made made it very made it much more easier to participate, um, especially uh, also in extracurricular activities. When I went to my video club after school, there was only three of us, not thirty. Um, it also helped me to make new friends um, and helped me to get to know people much more than I would have otherwise. Um, and even those extracurriculars themselves were a big turning point um, in my comfort zone at school. Um, my academic accommodations kind of stuck with me as I go older too, even in college. That's something I, I, I kept, and that's I know that's a lot of things parents ask about. Um, and preparing for college, as my senior year approached, I did a lot of practice college programs during summers. Um, the first one actually didn't go so well, and I basically cried for my parents to come pick me up. Um, but we compromised, and instead of living there and going to school, I just I stayed off campus, but I still went to class. But the next, knowing that the next year when I did do that program, I lived on campus and did the school program. Um, the biggest message I can really give about overcoming my SM and my social anxiety is about practice. Um, for everything that I tried to do, we would break it down into tiny steps and keep practicing the exposures. Um, doc, you know, I've heard Dr. Kurtz call before an exposure lifestyle, and that's really like the best way to think about it, best way to describe it. Still today at 24, that's something that I keep in my mind probably every single day of my life. Um, even things I don't necessarily want to do, I still make sure to do them because I know they will be good exposures and I know they will be good, good practice for me. Um, and it's exactly like practicing a sport or an instrument. Um, if you don't practice, you get rusty and it becomes much more difficult to do when, you, when the time comes. Um, but if you practice every day, things become almost second nature to do. And kind of conversely, it was almost exactly the same when I was little and I practiced practiced not speaking in school. Um, for months and months and months, I didn't say a word in school and I got really good at it. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I think it's, it's, it's difficult for older kids to deal with their anxieties because instead of practicing not speaking for a few months, a few years, they've been doing it for 10 or 15 years. Um, and if I got you to practice the piano six hours a day, like school six hours a day, 180 days a year for 10 years, I bet you'd be pretty good at it too. Um, that's about 11,000 hours practicing, not talking. And that's just in the school building, not including going to restaurants, going to the mall, going shopping. Um, all those things kind of add up and that practice kind of becomes ingrained. Um, which is why I think some of these intensive therapy camps that you may have heard of, like We Speak um, and Mighty Mouth, are really cool where kids, kids get to experience this practice of speaking in a condensed kind of time frame. I think um, I think you need just as much practice in the opposite direction to kind of counteract the avoidance. Um, the longer that the longer I avoid doing something, the more even more practice I need to get over doing that thing. Um, I volunteered quite a few times for Dr. Abney's We Speak Camp for SM teens, um, and it's always amazing to for me to see um, how these kids make that progress in such a short amount of time. Um, and when I was when I was younger, I never I never even knew somebody else had SM. I always thought like I was the only kid out there. 
Um, and only after volunteering at these camps that I see like there's so many kids out there who are dealing with these types of issues. Um, and not even just selective mutism, just social anxiety in general. There's, I think there's a lot of commonalities. Um, and it's so cool getting to watch these kids kind of challenge their fears, just like I was forced to when I was little. And I say forced to as it was in a good thing. Um, and I'm going to stop there with talking about my story. And I hope that more of, I hope to be able to talk more about what all of you are interested in through your questions. And Dr. Kurtz will. Feel free to jump in at any time to add your perspective, as you were there for lots of this stuff. I do recall that. I do recall. We got so many great questions, um, so many great questions coming in. Do you remember a turning point where you started to think there was a way out? Um, not, I would say there's probably many of them but also plenty of them were, went the other way. Um, when I started speaking in, in school, probably like in first and second grade, I was like, oh, wow, like I can actually do this, but like that maybe that was in first grade, but then in second grade, we kind of fell backwards where like things became very difficult. And then elementary school started to become easier again, but then once I transitioned to middle school, it was like I fell backwards. So it was, it was this constant push and build process with that, I wouldn't, I honestly wouldn't say that I realized that I could do just about anything that a normal person could do, probably until college, I would say. Um, I, I still have some of those moments, but it's not nearly as much as I did when I was little, where I think, like, this is going to be difficult for the rest of my life. And things are still difficult, but I, think I would say the there's a lot of times. I think one of the themes you've articulated tonight and at other times that we've spoken is you're not expecting to be anxiety free. You're expecting that it's going to always yes. pop up until you have to deal with it. Can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, 100%. Um, I don't, my perspective on therapies is not about reducing anxiety. It's not about getting rid of anxiety. It's just about kind of it was about teaching me that even though I do get anxious during things, I can still do them anyway. And I don't have to let anxiety interfere with my life. Doing this today, I was incredibly nervous before this, but I, I enjoy giving these types of talks and I knew that if I pushed through it, there was gonna be something good at the end and that that happens with everything. Um, going to dinner with friends or doing those things today, I still get those feelings of, I don't wanna do this anymore, but, um, I know that pushing through is, is the only really way uh, to go. Somebody was asking uh, about kind of your, your more recent challenges. Can you describe when you had to do something that you knew was an exposure? Like, it, like if I return my dinner because it, it was overcooked or undercooked, I, I don't feel particularly anxious. I say, do me yes. a favor, can the chef give us some more fire. Can you recall the last yeah. most recent time that you had to actually push yourself on what, what that was this morning. It was actually this morning. I went to Dunkin' Donuts drive-through and they got my order wrong. And I had to push myself to say, "Can you fix this?" Because majority of the time, I probably would have just let it slide. Um, it's probably plenty of times last week where I would have just let it slide. And there's still going to be times I'm still going to let it slide going forward. But just even little things like that is stuff that I think about um, day to day. Um, went to dinner last week with people who I met at school and at college, uh, grad school now. Um, and of course, uh, beforehand, I kind of got this feeling like, I don't want to do this. I, these kinds of things are difficult and they shouldn't be, but I, I still push myself to do it. I try to at least. Folks were asking if you recall how you have or have not told friends over the years about yeah. any of you know what you're diagnosis or, or what your uh, restricted yeah. speech was about? Yeah. Um, for the majority of my life, I never told anybody about it. I didn't like speaking about it, of course. Um, when I was little, really, the only people I would talk to about it were my doctors, um, school psychologists, maybe, um, my parents. But that was really only when I was really little. As I got older, I didn't even want to talk about it with my parents. And that was why it was so important to have uh, a doctor who I could talk about it with um, and plan out those exposures because having to deal with my parents was 
out of the question, kind of. Um, but in regards to friends, I remember the first, I remember exactly where I was the first time I told a peer that this was something I dealt with when I was younger. Um, and it actually came about, um, for those of you who don't know, um, I wrote a book about my experiences called Learning to Play the Game, My Journey Through Silence. And it was part of kind of, a, it started out as a high school project. Everyone in my high school had to do a senior project and I kind of decided I wanted to take this on. Um, and everybody has to do a final presentation. And it was like, I have to do a final presentation about this. I'm gonna have to say that I went through this when I do it. Um, and my friends, I didn't want it to be like out of the blue. So I made sure to tell them, I told them about it beforehand. And it was incredibly difficult, but it it made me much more at ease with them after I did it. Um, and when I went to college, it wasn't something like I, it's not something I advertised, but like, it's something that I was more comfortable talking about. Um, and my friends knew, like, they knew that if we went to uh, somewhere busy and I walked away for a few minutes, they knew, they kind of knew why. And that was really helpful for me to know is I didn't have to say, like, I'm uncomfortable now. I, I need to walk outside for a few minutes, but I would just do it and they understood. Um, and it was helpful, but I'm sure that's also, it was kind of very lucky with the friends I found, I guess, um, that they were comfortable with that and they, um, they were accommodating, I guess. Um, in a good way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not in the other way. Not in, not the, in the enabling kind of way. Right. I'm glad you made that distinction. Um, I think it was probably more than luck. You probably chose friends wisely. But I think part of what we do with anxiety exposures, and you know this from being on both sides of it, is we need to give kids information that it may not go the way they want, right? So when you yeah. told people, it could backfire. Did it ever backfire? Did you ever feel like you disclosed something that was personal uh, related to this and backfired and people pulled away from you? Fortunately, I actually do not have that experience. Um, I actually, I have the book on my resume and I was applying for jobs that actually have absolutely nothing to do with psychology and like somebody would see it and they asked about it and I would start up this conversation about how like when I was little, I wouldn't talk outside of my house. Um, and even then I didn't have any negative experiences about it. Um, I know there are people out there who do, but I was very fortunate and it's actually never happened. The one negative experience was actually in kindergarten when uh, I didn't speak. And what we did was we took a video of me at home, I'm sure Dr. Gertz knows this, took a video of me at home playing with my hamster and showed it to the kids that I actually could speak. Um, and it wasn't so much that they flipped out, it was more that I flipped out. Um, and I ran out of the classroom, um, but that was more so my uh, my inability to kind of know that other people knew. Um, but I haven't really had people who who's like say n negative things about it. People would say in school, like if a sub came to speak to me, they would say like, "Oh, he doesn't talk. Um, there's no point in trying." Or like if they would do attendance with a sub, they would say, "Oh, he doesn't talk." Um, but other than little things like that, was that a combination of relief? and anxiety when they would say that? It was mostly relief because then I wouldn't have to say anything. I wouldn't have to say uh, I'm here, but then they knew. Right. Um, People, of course, when you talk about medicine, they have a lot of questions. One of the ones that came yeah. up was what kind of medicine, but the other is I know from our discussions uh, over the years, there are times you were on medicine, off medicine, went back on, changed doses. Can you talk a little bit just about that trajectory? Yeah, so um, when I started in, in second grade on the anti-anxiety, it was Prozac, fluoxetine. Um, but I know different people try different things and there are hundreds out there. Um, but when we started, um, we just kind of built up a, to, a, to a dosage and kind of stayed on that for a little while. I don't actually remember exactly how long we stayed on the dose but it was probably a year or two or three. Um, and then we kind of weaned off and we kind of purposely went back on in anticipation of transition periods. So before I went to middle school, I went back on the medication, um, knowing that transitioning to sixth grade to a new school in a new place with a lot of new kids would have been difficult. 
um, and then kind and of send that off again. This one middle school, so it's a yes, huge, it's a very big school. Yeah, I always tell people I and, never went to that school and didn't get lost, so it's yes. big. Um, and kind of the same thing, transitioning from middle school to high school, went back on the medication. Um, and then there were some difficulties I had later on in high school. I went back on the medication, went back off. Um, and before I went to college, I went back on the medication knowing that doing this crazy thing that lots of people are get nervous about, people who don't have social anxiety have challenges with. Um, and I stayed on the medicine throughout most of college until the middle of my senior year. And I transitioned off the medicine and I haven't been on since. Um, I always think like, how would have things been different if I stayed on the medication for the whole time? No really way to know. Um, I know people do do that, but it wasn't something that we did. Um, and I know that if something comes up later on, I am I have no problems going back on the medicine. Um, I, think, I think what's really interesting is you you got to a point where, for lack of a better word, I'll say you were very zen about whether you were on medicine or off, meaning yeah. you weren't attached to it being a good or a bad thing and either I needed it now or I don't need it now. It's like when I turn yeah. up or down the volume on my hearing aids, it's, there's no yeah. emotional attachment to that. Uh, yeah, exactly. I I never really felt like taking this medicine was like giving in or something like that. I knew it was helpful. Probably start helped that I was only seven when we started with it, but yeah. um, I started with therapy when I was five. So I, I was very, it was something that I've grown up with for, for, for a long time. Um, I'm sure that helped with the process, but yeah, with with the medicine, I I view it just like some people who view Advil at times that when they they don't they take it when they need it, and when I don't need it, I don't usually take it. Right. The, of course, you know, always the under the uh, under the uh, advi advice of a doctor who's helping yeah. me with the dosage and doing all those things. It's not like I'm just deciding. Uh, second Tuesday of, of the month, I'm going to start. Um, when we have 117 uh, attendees, uh, one of the hard things for me is to try and find the themes and the questions and to you know pick out things. So I, I hope I'm doing it justice. I'm trying to present more of the questions to you that really relate to a non-professional's uh, perspective. One that stood out for me, because I think you'll have thoughtful comments about it, Somebody wrote, should my high school student join a club? And I know for you, the club experience uh, was was really instrumental. Um, and so maybe yeah, you can talk more about that, maybe about debate team and how that fit in. Yeah, forgot I did, forgot to mention debate. It's a big uh, big deal. Um, yeah, the the club thing, it was always kind of very contentious between me and my parents because, of course, they wanted me to do things, but. I was very club. adamant Join about the club. Join the club, Jonathan. Yes, uh, but I did not want to. Um, even when I was like in elementary school, I wanted to do soccer. But once I got there, I just sat on the grass and I couldn't move. Or I wanted to do karate, and we got there and we got outside, and I couldn't go in. Um, so when I was younger, I had very negative experiences with it, with the avoidance, and it was probably worse that I avoided those things, of course. Um, but definitely, when I transitioned to the new High school when I was older, um, joining those extracurricular activities was was incredibly helpful um, in making me more comfortable around people, making friends, because um, you're alone with a handful of people for an hour or two after school. Where during class you're in class with people, it's very busy. You're um, at lunchtime, it's very busy. You don't really have that kind of time where you're all focusing on a structured activity it's it was always much more easier for me to work on structured activities than lunch which is very unstructured and conversation focused um i kind of I started out with like a video club and that was like it was very important for me to do something also that i was interested in it's like if my mom told me sign me up for pottery class it probably wouldn't have worked out well um but having that conversation where they didn't have this conversation but this is the conversation I would have if I had a kid with SM is I, you have to do something, but we'll leave it up to you to pick. So I decided to join a video club team where we kind of film school events. Um, I 
wasn't going to be on stage at the talent show, but if I could film it, I could still be involved in the school. Um, later on, I did lights for our school musicals and school plays. I, again, I wasn't going to be singing on stage, and that was okay. Um, but I was kind of behind the scenes um, doing some of those things. But I could still be a part of, I was still part of the musical, and I kind of could take part in those types of things. Um, but making those friends and those extra activities and getting to know them was incredibly helpful. I wish I did it earlier. Um, I really wish that, I, because I, it gave me a lot of practice. Um, and I, I think if I did those things earlier, I would have been even more comfortable um, throughout high school and doing all different types of things. And 11th grade, I thought it would be a good idea to join the debate team. One, because I guess I like to argue, I'm very opinionated about things, but I knew that it would be good practice I knew it would be good practice to um, to be up there in front of in front of people debating. Um, I wasn't incredibly good at it. Um, I would get very anxious. Um, I started out my first year. I was just a researcher. I didn't even participate in the debates. Um, my second year on the debate team, I was actually the captain of our team. It's kind of ironic. Um, and I, I also kind of started out kind of <laughs> just a little bit. Um, I was captain of our debate team, and I wasn't actually going to debate, but somebody got sick, and I found out like 30 minutes before it was supposed to happen that they needed a substitute, and kind of, I was the sub, um, and I kind of filled in for my team. I don't think we won any matches that, <laughs> that, 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 uh, that meet, but it was, I thought it was a great experience for me to be able to do that, um, because you got to think on the fly, and do all these types of things. Of course, I was so worried that I was going to make a fool of my, out of myself. Um, and it was incredibly difficult, but just even getting that experience was, and being in a close community where you're working on this project was was great. So yes, I would say your kid should look into that. I'm sorry, I missed the last thing you said. The, oh, the question was like, should my kid join a club? And I would say yes, definitely. That My long answer is yes. I think what you are speaking to is that the choice of the club has to somehow relate to some passion that we think that the child has or could develop. There's a, a famous yeah. psychologist named Bob Brooks who talks about islands of competence, and which, which is just starting from the, the strength-based uh, you know, sort of natural yeah. interest. Do you ever Definitely remember? It was, it was, do you remember a time yeah. when you tried to get the words out? when you thought you were over it and they didn't come out and it was so humiliating that you thought all was lost? There's not a time that comes to mind, but I would pretty much guarantee that that would have been the case, especially in elementary school. Um, but even as I got older, like initiating things was incredibly difficult. And just even like is, is saying to somebody, can I sit with you during lunch? was incredibly difficult. And I remember many times like I wanted to do that those things and I couldn't and I felt very negative about myself and where I was, even though I'd been working on this problem for the past at the time, five, six, seven, eight years, thinking that I still can't do these things, then they should I, it shouldn't be so difficult. Um those things are kind of very were very frustrating. Um but I guess the most important thing is you got to just keep keep going at it. John, I, the, I'm going to ask you or share with you a, a difficult question from one of our teenagers who, who wrote in. Um, and I think it speaks in part to healthcare disparities and the fact that your family had enough money to be able to buy private care yeah. from a you know, private doctor. And um, yeah. But, you know, we know there are a lot of healthcare disparities and part of SMA's renewed mission is to try and understand those and deal with them and figure out how we can get services to everybody. That being said, the question is, I'm 18, I was diagnosed at 15, but due to insurance issues, I've not received much treatment. What advice do you have for me at my age in these times under these circumstances? Yeah, it's incredibly difficult. I think just about every day of my life that if, if I came from a different family, if my parents didn't push to school so hard, if we didn't go 
my parents didn't advocate for me so much. We went to go see four or five different doctors um, against the school's kind of own advice. And they told my parents that like, this isn't going to work out. They, my parents kind of kept going and said, we're going to keep trying. Um, going down to NYU, it's not a cheap place um, to be able to, to get that get that evaluation and get that diagnosis and that care. Um, I was very fortunate that those things kind of fell into place. Um, but if you're not in that situation, um, I think there's incredible amount of resources online about SM. And I think, I think the biggest thing for older teens is to try to like, really be honest with themselves about what their limitations are and what are the things that SM is kind of trying, is inhibiting them from doing that they really want to do. And it, it was helpful for me to have a doctor to put that plan in place, but it's not that that was 100% essential that if I didn't have a doctor that those things would have been impossible. Um, but with that knowledge of knowing that this is the way kind of SM treatment can work is that putting like these goals in mind and trying to break those down into the tiniest of tiniest details of how can I make these things more manageable. A lot of times um, I would build kind of hierarchies where we started out with a goal at the top of the page, whether it's um, I don't know, giving a presentation in class that we knew was coming up at the end of the semester and breaking it down into the tiniest of tiniest of steps from uh writing out what i wanted to say to asking the teacher if i could practice when nobody's in the room just to be in the space to asking if she would just listen to my practice to um maybe asking if i could go to her her extra help session where there's gonna be other kids there and then practice there just in front of a few kids or things like that i think if you i think it's possible to do those kinds of things by yourself but it, it requires a lot of a lot of honesty a lot of pushing yourself to do those kinds of things it's very unfortunate that anybody has to, to go through all of that by themselves um i know there are a lot of great resources are online i know kurt psychology has a free online web course i actually called, just uh, i just put that in the chat the select mutism but, learning yeah document. i think yeah. that's a great resource of of showing at least how dr kurtz's practice treats SM um, and it's a free free kind of online course about how they go through this. Um, it's, I think it's, it's primarily focused on younger kids, but it's, I think it's very much applicable to, to older, kids as, older kids as well and even adults. Um, a lot of these skills I think are, they're not one for one transferable, but they're definitely adaptable. Um, Dr. Ertz isn't making uh, the hierarchies for me anymore it's something that i've been kind of internalized and i know how to break those details down um yes and i'm sure maybe you have some additional thoughts about this question as well because i know it's something we're all thinking about right one of the things i want to echo that you're saying is that um this takes a lot of self-pushing at a certain point you know you're you're not three you're not five you're not six you're not ten at a certain point it's really pushing yourself into an uncomfortable space and i think yeah. what's just good for anybody out there struggling with this to know is what you said before that we're not looking to eliminate anxiety uh, but to sort of embrace it attack it go to it rather than going away from it but those small goals you know you we talk about exposure lifestyle which means every day whoever that 18 year old is challenging you challenging yourself to do something now in the era of COVID, because everybody sort of shut down to some extent or another, uh, one would have to be creative, right? You remember when I made you call the pizza store in the library? Yes, it was, uh, I remember sitting there in your office for like 30 minutes telling you that this this is unnecessary, I don't need to do this, but you might have been stupid. I probably did, I probably, I probably said worse things than that. Um, when you were in college, what what did accommodations look like and how did you go about uh, sort of not only getting them on paper, but invo invoking them? 
Uh, yeah, so I know at least in the U.S., all schools or all colleges are kind of required to still implement these accommodations. Um, they don't have to do kind of as much because at least the rationale I was given was once you get to this kind of level, there are certain things that are expected of you. And if you can't do that, that's that's there's not as much as they can do for and really the biggest example was when I was in elementary school, high school, um, teachers couldn't penalize me for not participating. But that's not something that they were willing to implement in college. Um, also, it's probably a good thing because if they didn't, it probably would have enabled uh, me to avoid kind of some of those things where I couldn't otherwise. But things that they were able to give me was extra time on exams, time and a half on exams. Oh, yes, sorry, those are the same things. Time and a half on exams, separate location for exams, which I find incredibly helpful where I don't have to take the test in a room where everybody's staring at me. Of course, they're not staring at me, but of course, that's how I feel. Um, and I was also to able to get my own bedroom with access to a private bathroom. Um, it was important that you know, having all this time outside with these other kids that I needed a place to go back to where I could be by myself. Um, and to me, that was very important to have that that space that was my own. Um, and if I did feel overwhelmed about something, I could go uh, go back to my room and I could be, be alone. But of course, the good thing about college is that there's also plenty of opportunities to not be by yourself. And of course, I had to push myself to do those things, but it led me to be, when I felt able to be around people, I went to go do those types of things. But when I felt like I couldn't, I had a place to go back to. Um, those were the three main accommodations. Um, and even grad school, I still get, I can still access those resources. You talked about having the, the safe and private space to go back to your room. I, I guess I want to ask you to amplify that a little bit because it implies, and I think you mean to imply this, that going out in public is hard work. Yes. Like it's, really hard it's, work. Yes, it's definitely easier now, but even in high school um, as a, and even undergrad, it's, it was inc it's incredibly difficult just to go and do kind of routine things. Um, going into the cafeteria is, was in, is incredibly draining. Once I'm done with that, I am tired. I don't want to talk to anybody. Um, still today, I could probably go days without speaking to anybody, but I, I have to kind of force myself to not do that. Um, and yeah, it was it was always incredibly, incredibly tiring to be kind of around people constantly. And in college, you are around people constantly, especially if you're at a school where it's primarily residential, which mine was. Um, so having that, if I had to go back to, if I went back to my room and there was three other people there staring at me, I don't think I would have survived. Um, Could you I, talk about our negotiations over my writing a letter for you to get a single? Yes. Um, so that was actually for our, um, the first summer program I went to in my sophomore year of high school. Um, I got gotten into the summer program, um, knowing that it was practice for college and it would be good on my resume for, for college. Um, but I wanted a single room with a private bathroom um, and kind of went to Dr. Kurtz and basically he said no. Um, but mm. then we kind of, negotiated about it and going into the details negotiation was i'll sign this this letter for you if next year we don't do this and the next year so i went to the first program and i had my own room completely separated from everyone and the bathroom was inside my room so i didn't have to see anybody to do anything but the next year i was kind of in a suite where i had my own bedroom, but I was sharing a bathroom with people, sharing a common space with people. Um, and that was a big negotiation that we kind of had to go through. We didn't really talk about, we kind of mentioned it, but there's a big difference, I think, in SM between accommodations and enabling. Um, but the big biggest difference between accommodating and enabling is where I was at a given point. So I don't think I would have been able to go to that first program if I didn't have my own space. Um, so it was an accommodation to give me that opportunity to allow me to participate in that activity. 
where if I continued with those types of things, or if I continued in college with not being able, with not having to participate in class, it would have been enabling because I was able to do that. I had been on my debate team. I had spoken to people. I had given presentations in school. But if I had that that listed down as one of my accommodations, it would have been enabling my anxiety and made me made it more easily for me to avoid certain situations. Um, and a lot of those things are very context specific and person specific. For one person. Not having to raise their hand in class could be an accommodation for another person. It could be enabling because they're at a point in their kind of progression where they're able to do those things. Somebody asked related to that, was there ever a point in your treatment or your process with this that accommodations like writing was allowed, encouraged, permitted, whatever, as a substitute for talking? Um, it was not. Um, I don't, I don't ever remember having it as a substitute. Um, and I think that was on purpose. Um, I'm sure Dr. Gertz can also speak about that and that, um, if I had those things available to me, it would have made, um, I think the big, another big thing with the SM is that it's, it's the longer kids are not speaking in school, the harder it's going to get for them to get over it. Um, and having these kinds of nonverbal cues in the classroom can be contributing to that. I think I understand there are definitely emergency situations. And I think there's um, I think there's plenty of exceptions there. I think I guess I'll pass that over to pass the rest of that question over to you. Parents always want that now. parents always want to know from you um, what What's appropriate to say to my kid about my empathy for their situation? And, you know, were the things parents said that were helpful, things that you know came from a good place but were actually harmful? What's your advice to parents about things to say and not say? Um, uh, I think it's a delicate balance. Um, I think it was very different depending on my age when I was very little like I was okay crying with my mom when I got home from school um, but when I was older that was definitely not okay um, so I think it's very much age specific um, but just I always knew that my parents would advocate for me in school with whatever I needed and I knew Dr. Kurtz would as well um, so making sure that I think I think it's helpful for parents to kind of get across to their kids but they know how difficult kind of this work is. But also, I think parents also need to stress how important this work is as well. Um, because we know that untreated childhood anxiety builds to untreated adult anxiety and builds or young adult anxiety and builds to untreated adult anxiety um, and keeps growing and growing. Not in all cases, of course, but I think that would be the case in general. Um, and I think it was, it's, it's helpful for parents to kind of get those two things across is that I understand how difficult this is. Um, I'm going to be there for you every step of the way, but I know we're going to get through this together. I know Dr. Kurtz sometimes has parents write a letter to their, to their kids about this. Um, I really like that idea because I definitely probably wouldn't have wanted to hear it from my parents, but having a letter maybe would have made that more manageable. Um, I think it's a very delicate situation, but one thing I also get a lot of questions about is how honest like parents are about their kids with this SM. Like some kids don't even know that that's what they have. And I think it was, I always knew that I had a problem and I think kids know they have a problem as well. And I think honesty about it is kind of the most important thing that you could do. Um, making sure don't like leave it under the rug. Make sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, parents being honest with their kids about they know that it's difficult, um, I think helps tremendously. Somebody was asking about the role of verbal intermediaries, which I guess raises the role of siblings. And perhaps you could talk about that and what you yeah. learned over the years and what you might be advising at this point based on your experience. The 
Yeah, the verbal intermediary, intermediary I had was my brother when I was in elementary school. Um, because he was in the same grade, uh, same school as me, he was three years older. But um, at least we knew in the school that if there was an emergency, they could get my brother and I would speak to him. Um, and he could advocate for me if I needed. Um, there were times at camp where they would do the same summer camp, that they would do the same thing. Um, as an example, my first time at camp, my parents were very concerned because it's New York summer and it's very humid and hot. They were concerned that I was going to dehydrate because I didn't want to drink. So we had like this signal system where I stuck up my left index finger and the counselor knew to go get my brother who was in another group. And he would come with me and we would go to the cafeteria, get a cup, go into the men's bathroom, go into the stall, and that's where I would drink. Of course, that sounds a little enabling um, in retrospect, but I guess not having me die of dehydration was probably more important than anything um, yeah, at the time. That's good. Um, but yeah, that's kind of an example of how that happened. And of course, that did not stay as I got older. Um, and I think it's important with all of these intermediaries, whether it is written or whether it's this thing I did with my brother or um, other types of accommodations, that it's important that um, for the kid to know that like we're doing this because we know this is incredibly difficult, but we're gonna work on getting over this. Um, and of course, I didn't have to stick up my index finger to get a drink as I got older. Um, a number of folks are asking about online resources. I'll, I'll say that those of us who are treating professionals in the Selective Mutism Association have the opportunity to post programs that we do on the SMA website. And so selectivemutism.org uh, should be one of your go-to places to find out about programs being offered. Uh, I think there are more treatment groups per se than support groups, uh, but that's a you know really good way to get help. Can you talk about being a pilot? Sure. Um, I have my pilot's license. Um, when I was thirteen, I my uncle surprised me with kind of like a flying lesson, and I when I got back home, I told my dad like this is something I want to do, and I did training. And funny enough, like one of the most difficult things of to flying lessons was talking over the radios, which I guess is kind of uh, understandable. Um, yeah. And I went also many years. Point of a pilot is they don't like you making mistakes to the tower. No. You yes, get it's, in, it's yeah. So you had good reason. Incredibly to be, high pressure. Yeah. Yes, it's incredibly high pressure where things are late. The way you speak is in a very laid out, structured manner, and if you mess up in one thing. You could have disastrous consequences if you say you're going to cross one runway and you make a mistake and somebody's landing on that runway. It's it's a problem. Um, these weren't things that I was thinking about constantly when I was in the plane, but I just knew like I don't want to do this. Um, fortunately, my instructor was kind of understanding that this was difficult, um, but we slowly kind of worked on it. Um, and because I was so young, we had plenty of time because you can't actually get your license until you're 17 in the United States, which is actually kind of an incredible thing by itself that that is even allowed. Um, but before COVID, I was flying like once a month and it's something that I do and I still get incredibly anxious about it. Even speaking on the radio today is something that I practice before I even say what I'm about to say and um, before I push the button to get my message out there. Um, but it's something I had to work on just like anything else in life that I had to work on with my uh, anxiety. John, all of a sudden I blinked and it's eight o'clock. Um, yeah. I know that the 100 plus people that were with us are so grateful that you had the courage not only to go through your journey, but to share that experience. Uh, many of us have been grateful that you wrote your memoir, share your story, and, and do these um, talks. Uh, I apologize for the questions we couldn't get to. We will take a look at them and figure out which ones we can answer offline. Uh, but on behalf of the Selective Mutism Association, we thank you for being here, John. Thank you for being here.
Good luck in your. Thank you, and thank you for moderating. Say thank again. You. I said thank you for moderating. You got it. And we're grateful again to the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation that uh, underwrote this program and is underwriting many other important things that SMA is able to do. So on that note, we will bid you a good evening.